We did some work in this book with the Great Place to Work Institute. And I'm not sure if you know it, but they're the ones that always write these lists, the 10 best, 100 best places to work. And they said the number one element that is important for a best place to work is to drive trust. And trust is created in the midst of failures, in the midst of crises. When things are going well, it's not that important. You don't build that trust. But companies then that do have problems and workers can see their bosses have their backs, their coworkers have their backs, are ones that create that dynamic that creates a great place to work. We teach in the San Francisco Bay Area in Silicon Valley, really at the epicenter of the innovation economy, where more unicorns are born there you know, every week than probably in the rest of the world combined. And there's something somewhat unique about that environment, and that is that it's OK to fail. There's something somewhat different if you walk up and down Sand Hill Road where the venture capitalists are, where if you fail and you gain insights from that and you put it to work, you have an opportunity for redemption. Now, if you fail, 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 it's probably not so good. But if you fail and can put that to work, then you have those opportunities and they're embraced by that community. So it was with that insight, having taught entrepreneurship at Berkeley for more than a dozen years, that John and I said, let's go out and talk to business leaders around the world. But let's talk to others as well. Let's talk to astronauts and jet fighter pilots. Let's talk to entertainers from film and television to music to Broadway plays. I mean, what fails more than a Broadway play, right? Let's talk to governors of states in the US and elected politicians elsewhere. And we saw some key patterns, different ways to process failure that you could then put to work. A company that I think respects failure as well as anyone is Google. It's not a small company, obviously, but they are not afraid when a product fails to pull it from the marketplace, like Google Glass. What do they do when they pull a product from the marketplace? Do they fire or get rid of that whole team? No, they reassign that team. In fact, they work to reassign those team members into other projects that can benefit from the insights that those individuals and team members just, just learned. So Google does a wonderful job at that. And Google even realized that their core business, the search and ad business, is one that at some point will likely fail. So what I love the, what, what they did recently is they created Alphabet, which you all probably know, to say we really have two businesses here. Our current business, which we are going to optimize and grow and make as efficient and valuable as possible to generate cash, and our business of new projects, space exploration, self-driving cars, medical devices, and those rules will be different for those different businesses so that they can experiment without having to run the entire business as a single business. They respect the fact that failure will happen. Why? Because they know that they're going to need another engine to drive growth for the next 10, 20, 30 years. John and I spoke to a broad spectrum of business executives and leaders in the US and around the world. And we found patterns. And we found seven stages of a way to deconstruct failure and turn it into a strategic resource. And we looked at failure in a number of ways this way, too. We didn't want to create a book that was around a memoir. I failed. I persevered, I succeeded, because you can't really put that to work. Lean Startup had been written. This isn't a book just for entrepreneurs, just around the entrepreneurial process. That's been done. This isn't a self-help book. This is a book about how generally we can put failure to work. So here are the seven steps. And then I'll give you some examples, and then we'll sit down and talk. Number one, respect the fact that failure happens a lot. Number two, rehearse for it. We do fire drills. We do a lot of other rehearsal around, say, 
If you're in the military, drills all the time, do we rehearse for failure in business? No, we don't. Number three, recognize it earlier. Put in place great early warning systems so you can react better. The fourth stage is react. And react quickly to stem the damage and then to be able to leverage the equity that you have with your customers and stakeholders and then be able to move on quickly. But before you move on, the fifth stage is reflect. Reflect upon what just happened. Why did it happen? And what are we going to do about it? Sometimes there's a temptation to try and respond too quickly. And then once you have those insights from the reflect stage, number six, put in place your rebound strategy. Go from the defense into the offense. That's a strong execution stage. And number seven is remember the lessons of failure so that you create that right culture to drive innovation, to drive growth. Seven stages of the failure value cycle. Three final thoughts that I'd like to leave you with. One is if you're in an organization, this is typically advice that we often give to larger companies, think about your portfolio of failure zones. There may be parts of your business, like a manufacturing line, or if you're in a nuclear submarine, no failure, please. But there may be others, like in new product development, where you say, let's make experiments. Let's create a lot of opportunities to learn new things. If we want to create innovation, we have to take risks. If we take risks, we know sometimes some of those risks will fail. So let's have zones where we allow that to happen. In fact, some companies even have failure metrics where they say what percentage of these new initiatives failed and what did we learn from them. Number two is to apply the golden rule, which is if your competitors had a microphone in your conference room and they knew everything about you, what would they do? Well, Apply that to yourself and how would you respond? So do that exercise, do that rehearsal around failure. And then number three, even though I teach a lot of MBAs, don't always think like an MBA. Projects fail or succeed. But engineering has failure, has a discipline around failure analysis. The creative processes have rough drafts. Failure is a key part of this. And science is the scientific method, is the ultimate. We learn through experimentation, through positive and negative outcomes. Like Thomas Edison said, I found 10,000 ways the light bulb doesn't work. Who all knows the concept of pivot? You all are familiar with pivot, right? Pivot is where something isn't working and you change direction. So let's look at an example on this. Does anybody here use the mobile application Bourbon on your smartphone? No. Which is, makes sense because Bourbon is no more. But Bourbon was funded by Andreessen Horowitz, one of the most admired venture capital firms. And its founding team went off and created essentially a Swiss army knife of mobile apps. It had gaming, it had e-commerce, it had social media and social networks, it had a little photo sharing application and a number of others. And when they took it to market and they took it to their, their um, customers, their demo beta customers, what did their customers say about the product? They said it sucked. They said they didn't know when to use it. They had great apps for each of them on their phone already. And the founding team almost threw the whole thing away and went away. But then they heard something. They said, you know, this little photo app you have is pretty good. We would actually use the photo app. So instead of scrubbing everything, they got rid of everything but the photo app. 30 days later, they relaunched the company. And Instagram was born. So by listening through that failure, they found a company that a year later was sold to Facebook for more than a billion dollars, and even since then has been the most uh, valuable, the fastest growing feature that Facebook has. Let's talk about VW. What happened there? Yeah, talk about a failure, right? Um, so one of the things that we talk about 
a lot in the book is, and, and I shared some comments on it, is creating a culture where you're not afraid to fail. You know, this whole concept of trial and error versus creating a culture of trial and terror. If the people who tried and failed didn't do so well, we kicked them out. So VW is fascinating. We don't really know what happened there yet. But looking at it, you can assume, you can say, something small happened. For example, they were going to miss the emissions test. You all know what happened with VW, obviously. By the way, who has a Volkswagen diesel here? OK, we've got a couple of those. So we'll see what happens, right? To resale value or whatever else. But when I look at it, I say, you know, there was a small failure somewhere, and people were afraid to come forward and to say, we have a problem. So they covered it up, and they covered it up, and they covered it up, and it's been going on for years and years, and it rose all the way to the top. And that's where a small failure and a bad culture potentially is a potentially existential threat to a global company. 